Hello, I'm Hannah Donnert with the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. Che enjoys bringing you the latest environmental health science through our partnership calls, webinars, science serves, publications, and social media. I would like to welcome everyone to today's Che Partnership Webinar, which is the third in our four-part series on climate change and health. This webinar is titled Climate Change and Extreme Weather Events. Our moderator today is Sarah Howard, founder and manager of diabetesandenvironment.org. We will leave time following the presentation for a brief Q&A session. You may type in questions through the Q&A feature available on the menu bar at the top of your window at any point during the presentation. After the presentation, our moderator will read out questions for our speakers to respond to. We will get to as many comments and questions as we can during the Q&A period. For those of you who call in on the phone, we have posted slides to accompany today's webinar on our website. You can download these by going to healthandenvironment.org. Please scroll to the bottom of the page and select today's webinar. On the webinar page is a link to the slides. Everyone on the webinar right now is muted with the exception of our moderator and our speakers. This webinar is scheduled to last for 50 minutes and is being recorded for our call and webinar archives. With that, I'll turn things over to you, Sarah. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. So our original moderator was going to be Ted Shetler, but he is out in California and um, wasn't sure if he would have power today, thanks to the PG&E power shutoffs out there. So it's uh, quite a coincidence, I would say, that we're talking about uh, extreme weather events. Um, it's already affecting Che webinars. So today we have two speakers on our third part of this series. And um, the first is gonna be Dr. Susan Annenberg who's an Associate Professor of Environmental and Occupational Health and of Global Health in the Milken School of Public Health at George Washington University. And she'll be speaking about the health impacts of extreme weather and um, chemical facilities and also drought out in the Southwest. Um, the second speaker is Dr. Bonnie Ford, who's a research scientist at Colorado State University in the Department of Atmospheric Science. And she'll be speaking about the health effects from wildfire smoke. And so at the end of both speakers is when we will have the Q&A session. So just, um, you can post questions before that, as Hannah said, but we will have the answers at the end. So with that, I will invite Dr. Annenberg to start. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you to the organizers of this webinar series for inviting me here and to all of you for uh, joining us. Um, as Sarah said, I'll be talking about two separate topics that are sort of distinct from each other, um, extreme weather and chemical facilities on the one hand, and uh, climate-induced drought conditions and airborne dust and uh, um, health impacts on the other. Um, these are quite different topics, but they are actually um, uh, tied together through some commonalities. Um, one is which uh, one is that they're both um, uh, impacts. Uh, they, they're both public health impacts of uh, climate change that we anticipate uh, sort of growing in the future. And two is that they're really, I would say, understudied and underappreciated uh, potential impacts of climate change. And so I'll talk about why, um, why that is. So to start, I'll talk about extreme weather and chemical facilities um, with uh, uh, disastrous, uh, a disastrous combination with uh, vulnerable communities located right around these facilities. OK, so I'm going to start with a, an example of a chemical disaster that actually has nothing to do with climate change. And this is the West Fertilizer Company explosion back in April 2013 in West Texas. This is one of the most uh, major uh, chemical disasters that has occurred in the United States in recent years. Um, this led to 15 fatalities, uh, 12 among first responders and three among the public, hundreds of uh, injuries, um, and uh, it could have been far worse. So I just want to orient you to the uh, map on the right where you see in the northeast corner here, West Fertilizer Company, the location of this um, of this company that stored uh, tons, 40 to 60 tons of ammonium nitrate fertilizer uh, on the ground, and that's um, sort of bounded by that red trapezoid uh, shape. 
And then you can see right across the street, there's a playground, there's apartments, there's a nursing home, there are four different schools, an intermediate school, middle school, an elementary school, and a high school, um, right in the nearby uh, vicinity due to lax uh, zoning laws that allow this sort of development to happen. Um, the particular explosion that occurred on this, uh, on this day uh, was, um, uh, happened to be in the evening. Um, and as a result, the damage, uh, in fact, pretty much uh, destruction of the schools and apartment buildings nearby um, occurred when uh, not, not, no one was in the schools. So this could have been far worse um, of a disaster. Um, and, you know, I would say that the West Fertilizer Company went bankrupt as a result of this. People lost their jobs. So the economic uh, consequences extend uh, beyond the immediate um, loss of life and injury. Uh, just to make the point that, you know, these types of major accidents can be utterly devastating for, uh, for communities. Here's an example uh, more recently of one that um, does have to do with climate change. So this was the Arkema chemical fire following Hurricane Harvey in August 2017. And here we had a, a facility that was storing organic peroxide uh, chemicals that needed to be refrigerated because they're, they're reactive. Um, in the heavy rains and flooding um, following Hurricane Harvey, the facility lost power. Uh, they also lost their backup generators due to flooding. So despite the workers actually moving the chemicals to higher ground and attempting to keep them refrigerated in, in uh, trailers, um, they were unable to do so, and there was a runaway reaction, and, and fires resulted. Um, here we had uh, several people injured and hundreds evacuated in a, a one-and-a-half-mile radius around the facility. They couldn't go back to their homes for a week. And uh, just on the right here is a map of Crosby, Texas, where this occurred, and you can see that the facility, the Arkema facility, was located within 100 and 500-year floodplains. This type of uh, disaster, these types of chemical accidents um, are more frequent than one might think. So uh, just on a personal note, when I graduated my, uh, from undergrad, my first job was to work at the U.S. Chemical Safety Board. Um, and the, the CSB is an independent federal agency that investigates chemical fires and explosions and releases. And um, this is uh, dating me a bit, but um, I used to carry around a pager and I was paged every time uh, there was a major chemical accident in the United States. Um, and I was, uh, this was only the accidents that sort of rose to the level that the CSB might investigate, so ones that had to do with um, fatalities and injuries. And I was paged at least once, once a week. Um, so this is a, it's a bit um, anecdotal, but, you know, some people express uh, surprise that these types of incidents uh, occur so frequently. Um, but to show this um, less anecdotally, we FOIA the CSB incident screening database. So every time somebody is, you know, no longer paged anymore, but somebody is notified that uh, these incidents are occurring, these get logged in the CSB incident screening database. From 2001 to 2018, that database captured over 9,000 incidents, which is an average of about one and a half per day. Um, about 20% of these occurred in the five Gulf states listed here. And about 40% had a death or, or injury to first responders or the public. So these are quite uh, frequent events. Um, you know, they only get reported on in the national media when they're really major events, um, but they often do get reported in, in local media. The um, problem is that we don't know how many of these are uh, triggered by um, quote unquote natural events. Um, these, you know, natural events, I think we need a better term for this because they're increasingly affected by anthropogenic climate change. But we don't know at the moment um, how many of these types of uh, incidents are triggered by things like um, flooding, fires, lightning strikes, et cetera. Um, so these are, uh, that was sort of what motivated us to want to just take a quick, uh, even just a, you know, a first cursory snapshot as to how bad this problem may be. And we may, you know, we expect that this could actually become worse in the future because of sea level rise. Um, so current conditions, under current conditions, we have some properties at low-lying areas that are affected by storm surge, um, and more properties would be affected in the future um, under sea level rise. 
So we just wanted to take a quick look just to see how many facilities are in this sort of situation where they're vulnerable to uh, the effects of extreme weather and how many people in vulnerable buildings like schools and medical facilities are in close proximity to these facilities. So we just took a look at the Gulf Coast in particular. This is a part of the country where we have many chemical facilities and we have lax zoning laws. Um, and we looked at the locations of highly hazardous chemical facilities within 50 miles of the Gulf Coast. And we overlaid that on census block group population size for 2016. Um, the definition that we're using of highly hazardous chemical facilities here is sort of our own definition. Um, there's not really a uh, uniform, consistent definition across government agencies. So here we're using EPA's Risk Screening Environmental Indicator, or RECI score. And we're looking at facilities that have above average RECI scores, the average being 415. Um, this is a score that accounts for the magnitude and toxicity of chemicals stored and uh, the population living nearby. So just for comparison, the Arkema facility had a RECI score of about 16 or 17. Um, and we're, here, we're looking here at um, chemical facilities that have a score that's, that are uh, much higher than that. So what we found is um, 872 highly hazardous chemical facilities within 50 miles of the Gulf Coast. And within a mile and a half of these facilities, which is the evacuation area of the um, Arkema incident, there were over 4 million people, almost 2,000 schools, and almost 100 medical facilities. So this is a problem that um, uh, you know, I, I would say is, uh, to use a non-scientific term, a uh, potential ticking time bomb. This is, this is a you know, potentially disastrous combination of chemical facilities located right near extreme weather events are occurring and vulnerable populations living right nearby. Uh, the, I, I just want to point out a quote from a lawyer for the um, Arkema uh, uh, company who said that all the experts agreed that this was an act of God of biblical proportions, never before seen and never anticipated by anyone. Um, well, I think it has been uh, anticipated by um, some people, but not enough. Um, this is a problem that really is not, um, is, is not um, anticipated in uh, regulations and it's not anticipated in corporate uh, planning um, in, in many cases. The Chemical Safety Board, I think, actually agreed with this. Uh, they put out a report um, of this incident uh, and concluded that there was no clear and specific regulatory requirement calling for flood risk to be assessed in relation to process safety under the regulation language in either the OSHA Process Safety Management Standard or the EPA Risk Management Program rule. Um, so they're highlighting this uh, regulatory gap here that um, is leading to poor planning, uh, where you know we know that these extreme events are uh, are uh, occurring more frequently, and, and we need to be able to anticipate them. Now, I focused most of this talk on these uh, extreme chemical disasters, chemical fires, and explosions, and and uh, acute releases. But we also know that there's other types of um, uh, environmental hazards that could uh, occur with uh, hurricanes and, um, and, uh, and flooding. So here we have hog farms and Superfund sites in the path of hurricanes. And these are covered, you know, almost every time there's a hurricane along the Atlantic coast, uh, you know, we have uh, news coverage of, you know, the Superfund sites and the, and the hog farms in its path. Um, I was really pleased to see that there was um, just uh, recently released uh, a day or two ago, the Government Accountability Office um, did a, an analysis of uh, Superfund sites across the United States and looked at their exposure to uh, wildfire, storm surge, flooding, and, and sea level rise. And you can now go to this nice interactive map and see where these facilities are located and, and which hazards uh, they're vulnerable to. Um, the GAO recommended that EPA provide direction on integrating climate information into site-level decision-making to ensure long-term protection of health and the environment. Uh, so perhaps this is a topic that is getting more um, uh, awareness as uh, people start to focus on it, uh, but I would say it uh, remains uh, somewhat of an, un uh, an under-researched uh, and not well-understood problem. So I'm going to shift now and talk about the second topic, the sensitivity of airborne dust to drought in the U.S. Southwest, um, where we're asking what are the implications for public health under climate change. 
And this was work led by my former postdoc, Ploy Echikolwasset, who's now at the Stockholm Environment Institute, with collaborators at Industrial Economics, EPA, and Harvard. So we know that there are major dust sources across the uh, U.S. Southwest, and in these southwestern states, mineral dust can make up about half of uh, PM2.5 monthly mean concentrations and even more of uh, coarse dust, uh, the coarser fraction of uh, PM2.5 to 10. About, uh, mineral dust can make up about 75% of that. We also know that without substantial reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, that southwestern North America will experience increasingly severe drought conditions, and that these conditions can lead to enhanced dust activity in the U.S. Southwest. But the impacts of those, uh, that climate-induced um, increase in uh, dust activity have not yet been well quantified. So uh, uh, Ploy, in her work, uh, took a look at how uh, PM 2.5 and uh, coarse uh, dust uh, measured across um, EPA monitors in the southwest U.S. vary, and found that monthly mean fine dust anomalies in each season during the years 2000 to 2013 show a dominant pattern of regional co-variability. So that essentially means that um, there's a lot of, uh, of, of co-variability occurring uh, among dust observed at these monitors throughout the uh, throughout these southwestern states, and that co-variability captured about 53% of the total variance. So that indicates that there's some larger scale influence happening here, um, uh, and we took a look at the climatic, the regional climatic influence. She also found that um, a unit decrease in the uh, regional mean SPEI-02, which is an index of uh, soil drought, is associated with increases of 0.2 to 0.4 micrograms per meter cubed in regional mean fine dust concentrations. That depends on the season. So essentially, um, as drought conditions uh, increase and you get uh, more negative SPEI-02, you get increasing uh, PM2.5. So we can use these historical statistical relationships um, and assume that if they hold in the future, um, we can apply them with uh, uh, meteorological simulations from uh, climate models to, uh, to simulate what the, in, what the increase in dust concentrations would be under different scenarios of climate change. So that's what we're showing here. We applied six different climate models um, following the EPA climate change impacts and risk analysis framework. And we looked at two different climate scenarios, RCP 4.5, which is a more moderate scenario, and RCP 8.5 on the right, which is a more severe scenario and actually the one that we appear to be following. So um, what we found is that projected decreases in soil moisture could increase fine dust levels by about 50 per, 57% over the U.S. Southwest in 2090 under RCP 8.5, um, and that these impacts under our CP 8.5 are larger than under RCP 4.5. We can use our knowledge from epidemiology studies that link PM 2.5 concentrations with uh, annual mortality shown here on the right and hospitalizations shown on the, on, sorry, annual mortality on the left and hospitalizations on the right. Um, we can use these epidemiological concentration response relationships to estimate the additional cases of mortality and hospitalizations that would occur um, under these scenarios. So what you see here in the blue uh, is an air quality constant scenario. That's assuming that air quality stays constant and we just allow the population and baseline disease rates to vary over time. And you can see that there's an increase in dust-related mortality and hospitalizations, even keeping air quality constant because the population is growing and baseline disease rates are changing. Um, and then if you uh, add in the climate-induced uh, changes in dust concentrations over these southwest U.S. states under RCP 4.5, we get an additional um, amount of uh, excess mortality and hospitalizations, and then even more uh, with the pink bars under RCP 8.5. So what we found is that in 2090, dust attributable mortality could increase by 220% and morbidity by 160% due to the combination of rises in dust population and baseline disease rates. And that climate-driven changes alone can account for about 40% of these increases. 
We also turn this into a dollar value to be able to compare against different sectors uh, that are impacted by climate change across the United States. And what we found is that the economic damages of these dust-related health impacts in 2090 are estimated to be $47 billion per year. And that's additional to the historical burden of $13 billion per year. And again, the impacts under RCP 8.5 are larger than under RCP 4.5. What was really surprising to me is that when we compared this result against the other sectors that are affected by climate change in the United States, this uh, impact of uh, increasing dust in the, just these four, four southwestern states rose to the top of the list. So the advantage, the advantage of the study that we ran was that we followed the EPA's climate change impacts and risk analysis or CIRA framework, um, which specifies different uh, uh, greenhouse gas scenarios and socioeconomic scenarios and climate models and uh, years of analysis. And by using all the same um, data inputs and consistent scenarios, we can then compare across the different impacts of climate change. So what we found is that compared to these projected, these other projected national scale climate impacts on labor, on extreme temperature mortality, and on coastal property, our estimated dust-related health damages of $47 billion per year, for again, just for these four southwestern states, ranked fourth. Um, that was much higher in the list than I had anticipated a priori. Um, and the estimate of the impacts of dust is about two times larger than um, the ozone-related health impacts. So, you know, I think a lot of times when we're talking about the impacts of climate change on, on air quality, we talk about ozone because, um, you know, I think we... Uh, the scientific literature is a little bit more um, uh, developed in terms of the impacts of climate change on ozone than it is for PM 2.5. Uh, but here we found, you know, it really is important to constrain our understanding of how climate change will affect different sources of PM 2.5, including dust and wildfires and the impact of biogenic VOCs and other sources, um, because this, uh, these impacts do rise to the top of the list of the um, of the sectors that are affected by uh, by climate change in the United States. So I don't really have any sort of uh, major concluding slide here. Uh, I would just end with a final thought that you know these two studies might seem quite different, looking at the impacts of um, extreme weather on um, on chemical disasters and vulnerable communities living nearby on the one hand, and um, impacts of drought conditions in the southwest U.S. on dust on the other. Um, but I would say that a, a major commonality between these two is that they're very much understudied impacts of climate change. They're very important for different, uh, different regions of the United States. And, um, you know, what I presented is really just scratching the surface, uh, especially for the chemical facilities. And, you know, in that case, we, we literally just took a look at how many facilities were um, in flood zones uh, you know, within a certain distance from the, the Gulf Coast and how many people were living around them. Um, there's so much more research to be done on these two topics. And I would say they are, you know, more research is really warranted due to the large potential consequences for public health. And with that, I will hand it over to Bonnie Fort. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Annenberg, for your talk. Um, and um, wanted to pass this on to Bonnie. She's pulling up her slides now. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. It was a great talk. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so I think it's a kind of a good introduction. I'll be using some of the similar terms. I'm going to be talking about future fire impacts on smoke concentrations and health in the United States. Um, I want to acknowledge my co-authors, you can see Susan is also on this paper, um, but I specifically want to point out Maria Valmartin, who did a lot of the um, model simulations um, for this project. This comes from a GeoHealth paper, and we had also done um, some studies looking at visibility in national parks. Um, just for time, I'm not going to include that, but that is um, an important thing to consider with changes in smoke concentrations and how that will impact visibility in our protected areas um, in the U.S. So before jumping into my motivation, I want to talk a little bit about terminology and give some caveats for this talk. Um, so I'm going to talk a lot about PM 2.5. Susan mentioned this as well. This is fine particulate matter. This little um, graphic from the EPA is a good example of showing you have a human hair here, 
PM10 is the blue and PM2.5 are these really teeny particles. So 2.5 is the size, it's less than 2.5 micron barriers of diameter. And so these particles are small enough that they can penetrate deep into the lungs, get into the bloodstream, and they're associated with a lot of negative health impacts. The caveat for this presentation is that I'm gonna use PM2.5 when I'm talking about smoke, but smoke actually contains a whole bunch of different um, compounds. It contains gases and other um, um, constituents that can be um, toxic as well. We use PM2.5 because the epidemiology literature finds that this metric is the, um, has the greatest association with a lot of these negative health impacts. Um, but I do want to use that as a caveat that there are going to be changes in other things as well. And PM2.5 can be, um, have a lot of different um, compounds in it as well. And so um, there could be differences in the smoke from different kinds of fires as well. When we talk about health, um, I'm specifically going to be talking about premature mortality that's attributable to PM2.5 exposure. But again, the caveat is that smoke exposure is associated with a variety of negative physical and mental health outcomes. These can be acute, just um, wheezing or itchy eyes, um, hospitalizations, but we're just looking at the premature mortality that's attributable to PM2.5. This is going to be the largest um, health and economic burden. Um, there are, again, um, this will be an underestimation of the total impact on health. And then for future, um, we are just going to present results from a single model, um, and this will give us a good idea about what the future could be, but it's not going to be able to represent um, the full range of possibilities. I want to jump here now into the motivation, um, and that's really that the role of wildfire emissions in air quality is already increasing. So this is a chart um, from the EPA and it's showing the average PM 2.5 concentrations in the US and how they've been kind of steadily decreasing. And this is mainly due to regulations of anthropogenic emissions. And so we've done a good job of regulating those and improving our air quality. If we look at the primary PM 2.5 emissions, and this is from the National Emissions Inventory, um, you can see that fires already make up a large portion of the PM 2.5 primary emissions. And this portion is going to be increased as we're decreasing these other anthropogenic emissions, but it's also going to be increasing because our emissions from wildfires are increasing. This is this paper from Westerling et al. that came out a couple of years ago showing that the wildfire frequencies intensities have increased in the U.S. Um, so this is Western U.S. forests. You can see in this plot the black is these temperature anomalies here, and they're seeing the association again with changes in climate. There are some that is due to our fire management policies over time as well, but the number of these large fires has been increasing in the last couple of decades. If we look at these maps of the um, total PM 2.5, so this was a paper that came out from Caitlin O'Dell, who's a graduate student in our group, um, looking at trends in this um, late summertime, so June, or July, August, and September, and looking that we're seeing again, these concentrations in general are decreasing for total PM 2.5, mainly in the Eastern US. But we see a lot of regions that aren't seeing a really strong statistical decrease in PM 2.5, and some seem to suggest that there's actually been an increase in PM 2.5. We pull out the portion that's just due to smoke, we can actually see that there's been an increase in trend in PM 2.5 in the summertime that's due to smoke. And this is important because even though we have um, fires mainly occurring again in the Pacific Northwest, in California, we have a lot of agriculturals and the fires in the Southeast, Fires are large and they are being able to create smoke that's transported over a lot of the US. And so this is a um, <clears throat> density map that's using um, polygons from the hazardous mapping system. So this is from a satellite showing smoke anywhere in the atmosphere column. You can see that smoke is being transported over a good portion of the US. So what we know is that climate change is already increasing the frequency and intensity of fires. We know that smoke from wildfires already causes air quality degradation over the U.S. It's shown a lot in the news lately. Um, and we know that the exposure to wildfires from wild, the exposure to smoke from wildfires is already a significant health and economic burden. A lot of studies have come out recently um, trying to um, calculate this, but we've seen that it's a pretty large number. And so our question here is that if fires are projected to continue to increase, what does that mean for smoke concentrations in health in the U.S.? And more specifically, we're really asking is that will these increases in smoke emissions offset our gains um, due to the regulations of anthropogenic emissions? 
And so the method that we're going to use is um, an earth system model for fires. So this is the CESM or the community earth system model. Um, and so we have an atmospheric model in here and we also have a land model. Um, and we're using this to simulate our PM 2.5 concentrations. We're doing these for these different decades. Um, and we use um, a decade range so that we can account for some of the um, interannual variability. So we're doing this 2000, 2010, 2040, 2050, and 2090 to 2100. And then we can use those PM 2.5 concentrations to do a health impact assessment. The great thing about um, this um, method here is that we're using this land model that includes a fire module. And so a lot of previous studies have just used statistical relationships based on um, previous climate variables and area burned, and then use those relationships and put them um, on future projections of climate. Um, but that doesn't always account for how those relationships might change. And so in this fire module, um, it's gonna to simulate those and self, and so it's not only just including some of the climate variables, but it's also taking into account changes in population, GDP, lightning, land cover, vegetation, and climate here. And it's gonna simulate different types of fires and then simulate the um, biomass burning emissions um, that are used in the um, atmospheric model. And by turning these biomass burning emissions on and off, we can get the fire-related specific PM 2.5 um, concentrations. In order to do the projection for the future, and again, Susan had just mentioned some of these, we're using the RCP, the Representative Concentration Pathway um, scenarios. And so these are not um, temperature projections, they're actually greenhouse gas trajectories for the IPCC, but there are um, temperature and climate projections that are associated um, with these scenarios. And so RCP 8.5 and the 8.5 and the 4.5 um, are the forcing associated you can see that there is a continued increase in the temperature, 4.5 kind of has this moderate um, increase. For population, we're using the shared socioeconomic pathway. So this is a framework to represent um, the, the plausible um, evolution of social and um, systems. And so we have SSP1, this is considered the sustainable world, and then the SSP3, which is the um, fragmented world. And SSP1, it's a, um, we have um, rapid urbanization, we have policies that are um, favorable to immigration, so we, we see some increases in population in the US. In SSP3, we have um, our policies are less favorable to immigration, um, slower urbanization, um, but rapid growth in developing countries. And so we can pair these together, and this is what's been done in different studies. So we have RCP 8.5 and SSP 3 together, and RCP 4.5 and SSP 1. I bring these up because they do um, change, um, including population where fires occur. Um, people do uh, suppress fires um, or cause them, and um, it does impact our health impact assessments as well. So these are the results that we show. Um, and so this is the um, the the results for 2000 and um, then we have 2050 in the middle for the RCP 4.5 and 8.5 and we have 4.5 and 8.5 um, for the future and you can see that both of these are suggesting that PM 2.5 concentrations should decrease over time this is the total PM 2.5 average but if we look at these maps of the regional we can see that some are suggesting decreases kind of the same regions that we've seen it in the eastern U.S., but there are some regions, especially in the western U.S., in these different simulations that are showing some increases. If we look at specifically the, um, the fire emissions to try to see what the impact is that, we can see that these are the fire emissions for, again, this is 4.5 and 8.5 on the bottom for the future. And we're just showing here the organic carbon and black carbon. So these are, again, the PM 2.5 changes in emission, and both of these suggest that fire emissions um, will continue to increase in the future. So this is going to have an impact on smoke concentrations. And so then if we separate out and we actually look at what is the contribution from fire PM and what is the contribution from non-fire, and we separate, we see that if we didn't have fires, we would actually see a much larger decrease, and this would be evident across both scenarios um, in 2015, and it would continue to decrease to 2100 but that these fire PM is um, actually offsetting a lot of these increases, and that's why we're actually seeing that some of these aren't as strong over time. And again, we can look at this map and see that a lot of this is in those regions that we saw increases in the emissions. So in the Southeast um, and in the West. 
Some of this is due to, again, the changes in population and some is due to um, changes in temperature, decreases in precipitation, um, reforestation as well. We can also look at different regions again, specifically breaking this down. And so this is the annual average PM 2.5 in the Western US and then also in the Great Plains. These are regions that already have a lot of smoke um, and we hear a lot about of them in the news. And you can see that smoke is becoming this dominant contributor to poor air quality in these different regions. Um, and that's gonna continue to increase in these projections. If we look at the summertime, which is in the season with the most um, smoke, so I'm going to note here that there's a change in scale, you can see that this is an even bigger problem. And so we have large increases in our concentrations of PM 2.5, um, mainly due to smoke in these different regions. So if we're looking at what the um, health burden associated, we do a health impact ass assessment. And the way that we do this is we calculate our changes in mortality by looking at the exposed population and we use these concentration response factors that have been developed from epidemiology studies that link this exposure to a specific health outcome. And then um, we use the baseline mortality. And both this and the population are coming from those SSP projections here. Caveat is that we're using the concentration response functions that have been developed from studies of urban pollution. And that's just mainly because there haven't been any epidemiology studies of the health effects associated with long-term exposure to smoke PM2.5. That's something we definitely need to um, have more studies on, but it can be more difficult um, because of the, the nature of smoke exposure. And so these are the results. Um, so these are our total mortalities attributable to PM2.5 exposure. And we see that that's gonna decrease. Um, right here, this is the total PM2.5 um, mortalities. And then I'm also showing the percent of total mortalities in the US. You can see again, all of these are going to be decreasing, partly due to um, the fact that people often live in regions where we have high anthropogenic emissions um, and less people live in the Western US. And so that's a coupling of why we have some decreases. But we all also see that the mortalities that are actually attributable to smoke exposure is going to increase um, over time. So that's the portion here, this red bar of the bar that's going to um, increase. So I just want to wrap up with some kind of final thoughts. Um, we have these projections and they come from a climate model, um, but why are they really important for us to consider? And so there's been a lot of different studies trying to project um, what fires will be like in the future, what smoke would be like. They use different models, they use different scenarios, um, but across the board, all of these suggest more burn area in the US in the future and more smoke. So this is going to be a problem. We may not know the actual magnitude, but we know this is going to be a problem. We also know that smoke exposure is no longer just a community issue. A large portion of the US experiences smoke from wildfires. We have these large fires that are causing blankets of snow across the US. Um, so we can't just expect small communities to deal with um, these impacts on their own. And while the US has um, a lot of land management strategies to try to reduce the number of wildfires, we don't have a cohesive strategy to reduce wildfire smoke exposure. Um, and so instead we give a lot of um, suggestions for individual actions people can take, wearing masks, putting in filters. Um, but this is um, a problem for a lot of vulnerable communities that may not have access to those. And so we need to be thinking about this um, from a much larger um, perspective than just um, trying to come in um, during these events. So that's it. Um, thank you guys for having me. All right, thank you very much. Um... So now it's time for questions and answers. So if you would type your questions into the Q&A box, which I think is at the bottom or top of your screen, um, I will read them out. And we already have a couple of questions. Um, I'm gonna start with a more specific question for Dr. Annenberg. Regarding dust storms in the Southwest, how do the dust storms impact and carry metal waste from mining and smelting sites in the region? Yeah, so great question. Um, we have had really only considered in our analysis the um, soil dust, so uh, not dust that is related to industrial activity or even agricultural activity in the area. Um, but you, we would anticipate that the same sort of drought conditions could um, disturb the, the, uh, any sort of other types of materials that are in the dust as well. Um, in fact, uh, fungal spores are also a key, a key area of concern in that area where uh, there's 
uh, uh, fungal spores that are sort of endemic in the soil. And as the soil dries under drought conditions, those get uh, lofted into the air with dust and can expose people and, and result in valley fever. Um, similarly, uh, any sort of industrial uh, chemicals or um, soils that are disturbed by agricultural processes um, could be disturbed and um, and be entrained into the air and, and uh, inhaled by by uh, by the communities. All right, thanks. Um, question for Dr. Ford on slide 18. I think differences between RCP 4.5 and RCP 8.5 estimates of mortality will be a function of both the climate change and the socioeconomic population distribution slash emissions of the SSPs. Is that correct? It makes it a bit more difficult to parse out which impacts are directly climate related, but thank you for an interesting presentation. That's totally true. Um, and we did some sensitivity tests where we kept the population the same for both of these, and these do have an impact. So um, our projections of where people are um, and where smoke occurs are both going to have an impact um, on the mortalities and the health impact that are associated with that. So um, some of those um, sensitivities are in the geo health paper as well. Um, but it's important to think about the relationship between our changes in our population and our demographics, as well as our changes in our smoke concentrations. All right, um, next question. This was probably for Dr. Annenberg. Um, does EPCRA, which is the Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act, offer us any protection along with public health emergency preparedness, or does it not go far enough? So EPCRA, yes, the Emergency Planning um, and Community Rights to Know Act uh, does um, ensure that the public has, or it's at, least, at least aimed at ensuring that the public has information about um, hazardous chemicals stored uh, nearby and um, helps the local emergency, emergency responders plan for any potential chemical releases. So a couple things, um, one is that, you know, just having knowledge about what chemicals are nearby is a really important first step. Um, and that's what EPGRA is aimed at. Um, it's difficult as a researcher to get access to that type of information. Sometimes um, they're only available to local emergency planning committees, the LEPCs, and you have to go uh, to each individual LEPC to try to collect the data. So, um, you know, in a way it's helpful uh, to have that kind of, um, information accessible to the local community, but it, I would argue that it needs to be more broadly accessible. Um, but I, I would also point people to the um, the Chemical Safety Board's report on the Arkema incident and the uh, most recent uh, Government Accountability Office report, which take a look at the regulations um, uh, that EPA has in place to try to prevent these major industrial disasters. Um, to uh, to see what they say, but they, they've done these detailed regulatory analyses and um, have uh, concluded, at least in the case of the CSB report, I haven't read the GAO report in enough detail yet, but the CSB report concludes that um, even with the uh, regulations that are currently in place that require companies and facilities to plan uh, for um, for different types of natural events, that none of them go far enough in addressing the changing risks under climate change. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, Dr. Ford, did your team come up with projections in terms of which populations regionally will experience the greater impacts? And also a follow-up with that on why do you think the Southeast shows a stronger signal than areas in the Western US? So we didn't break it down into populations, just did the different regions specifically and then have the maps that show. So we didn't, we didn't break it down into the populations. Um, specifically um, for the Southeast, there's a couple different things. Um, so there is changes in the, it's a decrease in precipitation. Um, there's increases in temperature. So the fires um, there um, are already projected to increase. It's also due to the population changes there. The Southeast already also shows a really strong reforestation. It's really dense um, forests there. And so that turnover can be a little bit more quickly for fires as well. Um, so there's, it's a combination of a whole bunch of um, different factors. Um, if, we, if it wasn't so expensive to run all of these simulations, we would have liked to kind of parse this down into 
break it down into each of those different factors um, and do a whole bunch of simulations. But um, we just did the ones with the population and the climate um, changes. Um, um, those were the only sensitivities that we did. So um, those are kind of the regions why a lot of the, the reasons why a lot of the Southeast saw those big increases, but that isn't something that a lot of um, other projections have shown. Um, because a lot of the fires that have happened have been in the West. And so the statistical models that have been developed have been really focused on why um, fires um, occur in the West. And so those relationships um, aren't necessarily applicable to the Southeast as well. And so a lot of those projections haven't shown those same increases in the Southeast. All right. Um, Dr. Annenberg, uh, how do you know how much of the hurricanes or dust storms were uh, climate change related, were you able to quantitatively make that statement? Great question, thank you. Um, so for the, the hurricane and chemical safety analysis, we did, we did not even attempt to uh, address that issue yet. This is really just a very cursory, you know, how many facilities and how many people live around them in flood prone areas. Um, so to do that kind of uh, attribution, you know, hopefully is um, down, uh, is in the future, but is down the road a bit. Um, in terms of the, uh, the dust analysis, to, to attempt to tease out the portion of the dust concentrations that are attributable to climate change, we looked at the two different uh, representative concentration pathway scenarios, the two different RCP scenarios, a more moderate climate change scenario and a more severe climate change scenario. And um, we use six different climate models following each of those scenarios to simulate um, uh, the meteorological variables that would be anticipated under the greenhouse gas forcing in those scenarios. And then we um, were able to take the simulated temperature, humidity, and precipitation changes from those climate models under the two different climate scenarios and um, uh, multiply them with our regression analysis of how meteorological variables affect dust concentrations in the U.S. Um, to try to tease out, you know, to, to estimate future um, uh, as future concentrations of uh, dust in the air um, under the two different scenarios. So in that way, we're sort of using our climate models to simulate under multiple climate scenarios what the difference in dust concentrations would be, and the difference between those two scenarios is the impact of uh, more severe versus moderate climate change. Okay, um, Dr. Ford. Uh, why are the PM 2.5 levels under RCP 8.5 increasing in Canada so much more than the U.S.? And how are the SP, SSP 1 and 3 built into your models? So again, that those are um, the, smoke, the smoke concentrations. And so this is going to be due to um, wildfires. And we didn't show these results in this paper, but and there's going to be a lot more wildfires in Western Canada and in Alaska, and that smoke can be trans um, um, can be moved across a lot of the um, into the U.S. and into Eastern Canada as well. Um, and so, we are going to see the impacts of climate change um, more in these higher latitudes. Um, right, you have a, a change of those um, are going to occur a lot faster, and so we're going to have a lot more fires in those regions. Um, and so that's why we see a lot more smoke again in those projections in the future. And using the RCP 8.5, again, it's, it's more drastic changes um, in our projections of climate change. All right. Uh, Dr. Annenberg, have you looked at the effect of increasing dust on valley fever in these states and also spread into other nearby states? And I will say that um, valley fever is one of the topics for our next webinar on this topic. Oh, great. Yes. Uh, so a very important topic um, and a great question. So the uh, analysis that we did that I'm presenting on now did not address valley fever, but um, a similar team of people is working to address that issue. Um, and uh, they have published already uh, a couple papers looking at how um, valley fever may change in the future under different climate scenarios. Um, and they're now looking at um, extending that analysis uh, further, looking at how, um, uh, how ecosystems change across the United States as well in the future. So I would point people to, um, there's uh, specifically a paper by Morgan Gorris that was published in GeoHealth last year. Um, and uh, there, will, I'm sure, is more forthcoming on the horizon. Okay. 
Um, Dr. Ford, and I think we're at our last question. Uh, could you talk about what type of smoke, wildfire smoke is um, most toxic? For example, like do the types of trees in the West that are burning matter? So this is a really interesting question. It's something we don't know a lot about. The EPA is doing a lot of studies trying to determine the toxicity associated with different fuel types. But we also find that the um, burning conditions are very important. So is it flaming conditions? So these really hot fires, they're going to produce a lot more black carbon versus fires that are smoldering a lot. A lot of peat fires, they smolder, they smolder a lot more. And those are associated with release of a lot more organic carbon. Um, we also have different hazardous air pollutants that are released with different fuel types. Um, and so we have a research, um, a graduate research assistant who is working on trying to look at the different HAPs that are related with different um, fire types um, as well. So it's not a question we, we know um, a lot about, um, but it's something that we are interested in understanding, especially when we're talking about the future and knowing that our forest types will turn over and these will change over time. Um, so, yes, it's a really interesting question, but we don't have a really good idea about the toxicity associated with different fuel types, but it's something that's being studied um, and hopefully we'll have more answers for in the, in the future. Great. Okay. Um, with that, yeah, we are out of time. And I would just note that um, the study that Dr. Annenberg just recommended will be presented on Valley Fever in the next webinar. And Thank you to our speakers, and I'm going to turn it over to Hannah to close. Great. Thank you so much. So everything's connected in Dr. Annenberg's work um, and Dr. Gordas and all the other speakers we've had in our past webinars to climate change. Climate change is really affecting everything, and um, it's important to kind of have that um, understanding of the interdisciplinary um, relationship. Um, so thank you so much, Sarah, for um, for moderating. We're approaching the end of our webinar today. A video recording will be available on Che's website soon, and tomorrow you'll receive an email containing a link to the video. The next Che Alaska Partnership call will take place December 4th and is titled The Perilous State of Federal Scientific Research. Retired NIEHS Director Dr. Linda Birnbaum discusses her so how so so sidelining science threatens public health. In addition, we are holding the, our last Climate Change and Health Series webinar on infectious diseases December 5th. To learn more on RSVP, please visit our website at healthandenvironment.org. If you are new to CHE and would like to stay updated about upcoming events or more, please sign up to receive our newsletter by selecting the Join Us tab at the top of any page on our website at healthandenvironment.org. Additionally, if you appreciate these CHE partnership webinars, bringing you the latest environmental health research for free, we encourage you to support Chase's ongoing work by making a tax-deductible donation via our secure website. Again, our website is healthandenvironment.org. With that, I would like to thank our speakers, Dr. Annenberg and Dr. Ford, for taking time to present today, and to Sarah for your excellent moderation. Thank you so much for joining us, and have a great day.